Hi everyone, uh, Dr. Stewart here. This is the first of our regular PowerPoint lectures. Um, you can find this, Anatomy and Physiology 1, Introduction 2, is the, the first of the lectures on your Canvas site. If you haven't found that yet, you could go there now and bring that up or print it out or have it on a second computer or something where you can walk through it if you want to and make notes. Otherwise, I'll be showing you the PowerPoint here as I talk. The Anatomy and Physiology courses um, start off briefly with AMP1 talking about the uh, combining of uh, chemicals, molecules into larger and larger proteins and, and substances of that nature that will combine to form cells, which is our smallest true living unit that we have. We combine the cells into tissues, because if you have a whole group of cells that's very has a similar um, job to do, you form a tissue without that out of that, like muscle tissue. You form uh, take several tissues and you can make a, an organ. Like here's a here is a, a blood vessel and it's got a connective tissue around the outside, it's got some muscle tissue in there, it has endothelial tissue on the inside, and so you're combining a, a few different tissues to form a single useful structure, like a blood vessel or, or the heart. And then if you combine several organs, you have an organ system. And so once we get through that, from then on, these courses are going to be system related. We'll do the cardiovascular system and we'll do the digestive system and the reproductive system and so forth. Systems then will all work together to form the entire organism. For instance, the cardiovascular system is a closed system where the heart pumps blood out and it comes back, but the blood while it's moving interacts with the lungs that put oxygen into the blood with the digestive system that puts nutrients into the blood and it releases waste products into the excretory system. So the systems will interact to allow the entire organism to live. ANP1 is the basics of cells and, and tissue function and how they work and how they turn each other on to do their jobs. And then the systems we'll cover will be the integumentary system, which is the skin. Whoops, where's my cursor? There it is. Integumentary system is the skin. We'll have the bones, muscles, and nerves. The skeletal system, the muscular system, and on the next slide over here, we have the nervous system. So those are the, the um, systems that will be covered in A&P1. A and P2 covers everything else. So you're going to have the reproductive systems, the endocrine system, cardiovascular system, lymphatic, respiratory, digestive systems, the urinary system, and the kidneys and the bladder and all of that sort of thing. Reproductive here. So um, there, A and P2 covers a lot of a lot of ground. Now one thing about um, your bodies and the way they function and how these systems all work to regulate themselves is a desire of your body always to maintain homeostasis. Homeostasis is where everything is as neutral and natural it can be. No energy is being wasted. Your temperature is not too high. It's not too low. Your blood pressure is not too high. It's not too low. It's, you're trying to keep it exactly where it needs to be. All of these different systems at the same time. So what we have are a number of, of, of setup, you know, systems within systems that if your blood pressure goes up, you get signals it relaxes your blood vessels and slows your heart and your blood pressure goes back down. If your temperature goes up, you get signals and it causes you to sweat and the temperature goes back down. So what we're trying to do is maintain the steady state of homeostasis. This is done with what is called negative feedback loops. 
If your blood pressure gets too high, you got to bring it back down. And then the act of bringing it back down turns it off. That's the negative feedback. Once your blood pressure gets to normal, you turn that regulatory mechanism off so it doesn't go too low. If your temperature goes up too high, you only sweat long enough to bring it down to where it's supposed to be, and then it turns itself off. So it has negative feedback. The desired result turns that system, that regulatory system, off. We have a small number in our uh, bodies of positive feedback loops. That is, when something happens, the stimulation makes it happen more instead of less. This is to achieve things like endpoints. You know, if your blood pressure goes up, you don't want it to keep going up and up and up until you explode. What you want it to do is come back down and then stop. You know, stop changing anymore. But if you need to blood clot, if you cut yourself, you start a system. And as it starts, it activates more stuff and more stuff and more stuff. And the more it activates, the better it works until it finally results in a blood clot. And that end point finally stops the system from doing anything more because you've achieved your result. Childbirth is the same way. You know, you stimulate the uterus. It causes stress. That causes you to stimulate it more. It causes more stress. It stimulates more and more and more and more and more until out pops junior. And then it's over and you have achieved that end point. Positive feedback has nothing to do with homeostasis. That's negative feedback loops. That's what they do. They bring everything back to normal. Positive feedback loops are designed to actually achieve something. A sneeze is a positive feedback thing. So, as a result, what we're going to learn is what mechanisms and negative feedback loops primarily produce the resting state for each of our systems. What is it that makes our heart beat 70 times a minute normally at rest? How do, how do we control that? And then what happens during exercise to make it go up? So we learn what happens at the resting state, blood pressure, temperature, bone growth. It's very stable unless you break one and then you suddenly have this frantic, you know, a bunch of changes that can happen. Then we learn the mechanisms that cause proper responses to stresses, exercise, too much heat, too much cold, whatever. What are the proper responses? And then you learn to identify some improper responses that are caused by disease. If you're not actually cold, you shouldn't shiver. But when you're sick, when you get the flu, you get the chills and you shiver. So we'll see why you shiver when you're not cold what causes that abnormal reaction? So we have what makes you resting state, what causes normal responses, and then what are the abnormal responses of disease? A little bit. It's not a pathophysiology course, but we'll, t we'll hit on some of those things. Those often are the most interesting anyway. <clears throat> like I said, this is intro. This is, you know, what is anatomy and what is physiology? Anatomy is where all your parts are. Physiology is how they all work. Anatomy shows you where your heart is and where the chambers of the heart are and what they're called. Physiology says what makes your heart beat faster and squeeze harder during exercise? What makes it squeeze worse if you get heart disease? Okay, so that's physiology. Anatomy, we're going to be looking at all the parts. You need to start learning some of these areas of the body. They'll, a lot of them get used over and over again as we learn the muscle of the forearm. You know, we have a brachial muscle, brachialis muscle down here, and we have um, an axillary nerve in the armpit. So we'll use these terms over and over again, but starting to go through these and get used to them, you know what a cervical brace is. So the cervical area is your neck. The nasal is your nose, oral is mouth, orbit is your, is your eye, your eye orbit, femoral is where your femur is, it's your upper leg. So learning these locations in the body is going to help you learn the body parts as we go on. Here it is from the 
from the rear. Uh, plantar is the sole of your foot. Think about plantar warts. People get plantar fasciitis. It's on the bottom of your foot. Uh, lumbar, your lower back. Everybody gets lumbar pain. Gluteal, the buttocks. Femoral on the, uh, here is from the thigh. So start learning these. You're not going to be in your first test tested on a whole bunch of these, these locations, but maybe a few of the main ones. And certainly you'll need to know them as the course goes on. You also need to learn how in medicine, in an anatomy, we talk about directions. You don't say something is up or down or sideways. If something is higher than something else, that is superior. Your head is superior to your trunk. Your trunk is superior to your hips. Your trunk is inferior to your head. Down is inferior, up is superior. Anterior is in the front. My face is anterior to my head. Okay, my buttocks are posterior to my pelvis. So anterior is in the front, posterior is in the back. Medial means toward the middle. My heart is medial to the lungs. The lungs are lateral to the heart. Medial toward the medium center lateral toward the outside, superior, inferior, medial, lateral, anterior, posterior. Here's lateral. Intermediate means between its, its two things. Um, you might, over here somewhere, you might have a, a spot on your cheek that is it's between two other things. And so you say it's intermediate to those. It's not, it may be medial to one and lateral to the other, but it's intermediate between them. Here's one that's important, proximal and distal. Proximal means closer to your body center, closer to the point of attachment of that part to your body, closer to the middle, proximal. So this joint is proximal to this joint. This joint is proximal to this joint. This joint is distal to this joint. My hand is distal to my wrist. My elbow is proximal to my wrist. Okay? If it's closer to your point of attachment, closer to the body center, it's proximal. My knee is proximal to my ankle. My ankle is distal to my knee. And if you're talking about like a deep cut, it's a deep cut. If it's a superficial cut, it's close to the surface. So we're talking about how deep something goes in. If you have a long needle, it goes deep. If you have a, a just a skin pop, it's a superficial injection. Okay, this is one that gives people crazy sometimes. These are dividing into sections so you can talk about the direction that movements happen in the body. We divide ourselves into three planes. We're three-dimensional. And so the frontal plane, if you were to put your front against the wall, the wall would be your frontal plane. It is even with your front. The jumping jacks happen in the frontal plane. You could do that with your nose against the wall, okay? That's the frontal plane. The frontal plane cuts you front and back, and the movements are sideways. A cartwheel is in the frontal plane. The sagittal plane comes right straight forward and back. The mid-sagittal especially is right in the middle, but anything that goes straight forward and back is in the sagittal plane. So walking forward, all the motions involved in marching or walking forward are in the sagittal plane. Okay, just bending your elbows and straightening them back out again. That's a sagittal plane movement. Sticking your arms out to the side and bringing them back is in the frontal plane. The transverse plane is a twisty plane. It cuts across the middle. 
This movement of my neck is in the transverse plane. Rotating my shoulders is in the transverse plane. So shaking my head, no, is transverse. Nodding my head is in the sagittal plane, front and back. And this way to the side is in the frontal plane. It's even with my front. So you'll have to learn all these movements. That's okay. We have a whole semester to use them over and over and over and over again. But it's important because when you learn the muscles, you have to learn what they do. The biceps cause you to bend your elbow. Well, that happens in the sagittal plane. That's called elbow flexion. You're bending your elbow. That's in the sagittal plane because it's going front and back. Now, see if I can get back far enough to do this. The, uh, when you're starting, uh, you start out what's called the anatomical position. The anatomical position, you're standing, um, Standing, you know, your feet about shoulder wide, your palms are forward and at your side. So anything that I move from here, I can move forward and backward. Elbow flexion, elbow extension, elbow flexion, elbow extension, hip flexion, hip extension, shoulder flexion, shoulder extension. Flexion, you're moving away from the anatomical position. Extension, you're moving back. Abduction and adduction are in the frontal plane. They are like jumping jacks. Abduction is moving away from the body. So abduction, think about if you're abducted, you're taken away. You know, somebody takes you away. Abduction moves you away from the body. Adduction adds you back to the body. A B-duction, a D-duction. Abduction of the hip. Move your leg out to the side. Adduction puts it back. Okay? Your hands. Abduction. Adduction of the fingers. Away. Together. Abduction. Adduction. While we're here, let's do rotation. Rotation is in the transverse plane. So if I were to do this, if I move my arms like this, I'm rotating them, okay? I'm rotating the shoulder. I'm rotating my trunk. I'm rotating my neck, okay? Those are, are um, transverse plane motions, rotation. And, for instance, rotation of the shoulder is important. When you throw a baseball, you don't bend your elbow like this. You rotate it. And when you rotate your arm, that's that internal shoulder rotation, the rotator cuff muscles do it. You know, we'll learn all about that. So you want to know what shoulder rotation is, which is twisty compared to just do, do, or do, do. Let's also do right now, let's go with, uh, oh, hyperflexion and hyperextension. If I flex my elbow, to hyperflex, I would bend it like too far, okay? Hyperextension of your elbow would straighten it out too far, okay? It would hurt. Now, your hip is better at that. If I want to flex my hip, can I see it? Flex my hip. I extend my hip, I can hyperextend my hip without hurting myself because it moves in that direction. So if I extend all the way back to where I started, I hyperextend if I go farther than that. Same thing, flexion of the neck, extension of the neck, hyperextension of the neck. Prone is to lie on your stomach or turn face down. That's the prone position. Supine means to lie on your back. And we use that at the elbow also because this twisty motion just of the forearm is called pronation 
and supination of the wrist. Pronation and supination. Pronation or of the hand, actually. The, the movement is happening at a, a special joint in the elbow. It's not actually the wrist that's doing the job. It's your elbow that allows you to pronate and supinate. Inversion and eversion. In, I'm not going to stick my foot up there, but inversion means to pull your, your uh, sole of your foot toward the middle, and eversion is to point it at, to the outside. Inversion and um, eversion at the ankle allows your bottom of your foot to go in toward the middle or turn out to the outside. Here we have lateral flexion of the neck, just means bending it side to side this way. So, these are all going to be critical for you to know as we go along. Some of them, the more uh, straightforward ones, you know, I think you should know flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, and rotation. You know, you really ought to know those um, for, for even for the first test. Um, maybe you want to start learning all of them, you know, because we're going to, as soon as we start talking about bones and muscles and stuff, we're going to be moving the body because that's what bones and muscles do for us. Another basics of, uh, anatomy is just the location of stuff. And so... For now, we're just going to hit some major body cavities where guts are located. We have the cranial cavity, which is where your brain right, resides, assuming you have one. We have the spinal cord is in the vertebral cavity, if you have a spine. <laughs> okay, enough of that. Enough of that. Uh, the vertebral cavity or the spinal cavity. The thoracic cavity um, is where your lungs and heart are. Abdominal cavity is where all, basically all the rest of your viscera, your in, intestines, your stomach, your liver, your heart, your, I mean not your heart, your spleen, large and small intestine, uh, you know, all that stuff is in here. The pelvic cavity has the very end of the digestive tract and your reproductive organs and your bladder. So peeing and reproducing and defecating, you know, that happens here. All the digesting and all that happens here. Breathing and heart happens up here. Here it is from the front. Everything above the diaphragm is the thoracic cavity. It's kind of divided up a little bit because your lungs are on either side here in their own pleural cavities. And the heart is in the inferior mediastinum. The mediastinum means in the middle behind the sternum, <laughs> breastbone, okay, the mediastinum. The superior mediastinum has your esophagus and your and your windpipe in it. But, you know, the, uh, the most important features of the thorax are the heart and lungs. Then you have the diaphragm, which is your big breathing muscle. Below that, you have your all of your major organs down here. The liver is over here. The stomach is over here. The pancreas and spleen are over here. Your kidneys are back here behind everything else. The uh, small intestine, your large intestine, all that stuff is in here. Then down here you have the bladder right at the very bottom of your pelvis there and your uterus and ovaries if you're a female. If you're a male, the reproductive organs have dropped down into the scrotum. A lot of these cavities are separated by these various membranes. Their membranes are between the lungs and the heart, so the heart won't damage the lungs. It's beating all the time, and the lungs are really delicate. So they have to be protected from each other. So especially the pericardium is like this, but a lot of them are this way, in that they form two layers with a space in there. It's either filled with fluid or, or 
hardly anything. Sometimes the two spaces are just sitting next to each other, like wearing a, two pairs of socks to keep you from getting blisters. If you move the inner pair and the outer pair doesn't move, then it doesn't rub against the surface out here. So a lot of your, um, your uh, membranes that separate the heart from the lungs or the heart from the, the lungs from the chest wall or, you know, even the stomach from the intestines or something in, in many cases are double walled um, membranes. Here we have the heart membrane. It has an inner and outer Mem uh, layer of this pericardial sac and it's filled with fluid so it's lubricated all the time like two pairs of socks with grease in between them to keep it really uh, movable um, cardiac effusion uh, happens when you fill the space in here with fluid and it starts putting pressure on your heart you can get that if you have um, pericarditis if you have some kind of heart disease. Cardiac tamponade is what happens if you burst a blood vessel or get a hole in the in the heart and this pericardial sac starts filling up with blood and it fills up really big and really strong and it pushes on the heart and it can kill you. And so if you look at any of the go to any of the movies or TV shows that are, you know, whether it's Grey's Anatomy or whoever's on these days that has uh, these, uh, you know, doctor shows, they will always have somebody that comes in who's been shot or stabbed or something, and they find that their pericardial sac is filling up with blood, and they put a tube in there, and the blood squirts across the room as it releases the pressure on the heart. They love to do that because it sounds, it's so dramatic on TV. Now here's where your guts of the abdomen lie. We know where the lungs are, and we know where the heart is. Those are all in the thorax. It's above the diaphragm. But in the uh, abdo abdomen, and especially the abdominopelvic region, which includes everything, you have to say, well, this person has pain over here. You could say, well, it looks like it's kind of in the, uh, you know, part of the intestine or part of the, you know, whatever. But instead, they just kind of draw a quadrant here and they say, if, uh, if you have pain in the right upper quadrant, it's this stuff. It's liver. You're likely to have gallstones. Okay, that's, that's what's there in the right upper quadrant. And the left upper quadrant, you have your stomach and your pancreas and your spleen. Right lower quadrant, you have some of your intestines and your large intestine. You also have your appendix. Lower left, or right, right lower, I'm sorry, right lower quadrant pain is likely to be appendicitis. Left lower quadrant pain is just going to be some GI stuff over here. Could be kidney if it's kind of farther back toward the back of your body. But right upper, left upper, right lower, left lower. And remember, the right and left come first. So if you see R-U-Q, it's right upper quadrant. L-U-Q, left upper quadrant. These are the main things that are there. Now remember, your patient is facing you. So this is your patient's left, and this is your patient's right. That's why it's reversed for you, the way you're looking at it. So left upper quadrant is on your right as you're looking at your patient facing you. And if you want to be more specific, you break it, you put two lines each way, and then you've got nine spaces instead of just four. And you have the epigastric region, means uh, the upper part of the stomach. And that's important. You know, people with um, um, gastric distress, with gastric reflux, um, and that kind of stuff, are likely to have pain in the epigastric region. Um, the umbilical region is right around your belly button. Hypogastric region means below all that stuff, or it's also called the pubic region. Those are used a lot. Epigastric, umbilical, hypogastric. These upper two regions 
I hardly ever get it, hear them call this. It's the right hypochondriac and left hypochondriac region. Chondro is the term for ribs. It doesn't mean you think you're sick all the time. But because we use hypochondriac to mean somebody thinks they're sick all the time, I, you know, they just pretty much don't use it. They just say, you know, right upper quadrant, right left upper quadrant. But that's what they're called. The lumbar region starts on the front and goes all the way around to the back. And that's really where your kidneys would be. If you have right lumbar pain, it's probably going to be toward the back. And it's probably going to be, you know, right around there. And that could be kidney pain, left lumbar. And then the inguinal region and iliac region, you'll learn that the iliac crest, one of your big hip bones, comes right there. So it makes sense to call it the iliac region. A more useful term, though, is likely inguinal. Inguinal refers to the fold right here where your leg meets your pelvic region. When a male child is born, the testes, which are located up in the pelvic region, why did my cursor disappear? There it is. Located up here in the same place a female's ovaries are, the female's ovaries stay there, the male's testes drop through a little hole in the abdominal wall so it can go down into the scrotum. This is called the inguinal canal. And the inguinal canal, it goes out here, that's why they call it the inguinal region out here, is where guys get hernias because it's a weak spot on the abdominal wall that is real susceptible to blowing out if you pick up something too heavy. So it's in the inguinal region. and Oh, that means it's, you know, at the very bottom of the pubic region off to the side. That's the inguinal region. So you can describe, you know, if somebody has bladder pain, you know, it would be in the, in the lower uh, pelvic, you know, pelvic region here. Pain over here would be inguinal. If they have appendicitis, it could be in the, uh, you know, right lower quadrant, or it could be, you know, you could talk about it being in the, inguinal, the joint between the inguinal and the, and the pelvic region. You know, if it's liver pain, if it's gallbladder pain, it's going to be in the right up hypochondriac or just the right upper quadrant region. So that's the way you're able to describe what's going on with your patient's abdomen. A few small cavities here. We have the middle ear, which is filled with air. It allows your, your eardrum to vibrate and send signals in there. It joins in with the nasal passages. So the air can move back and forth between the two. That's why your ears pop when you go up in an airplane, because ear, air is pushing through into here. You know, the oral, ca the nasal cavity, the oral cavity. Here we have images. This is a, an image taken in the frontal plane where you're looking from the front. You're taking a slice directly side to side and looking at the heart and the arteries of the heart. Whereas this is a transverse slice, like you committed Harry Carey. This is the spinning around, you know, plane. So this is a, a transverse um, CT scan. So if you're looking at a CT scan and it says, well, this is a sagittal view, you know, it's from the side, you know, looking at, at, at a slice that goes right this way. And if it's a frontal, it's looking at your front. And if it's transverse, it's looking down from the top or up from the bottom where you could spin around. Like if you put a, an axis right through here, you could spin around on that axis. And that's plenty of stuff for the first lecture. So there will be another lecture coming up later in the week, along with a couple of labs. Good luck to you all.